Hi everyone. So recently I took to social media and asked you what questions you have. And wow, there were a lot of questions and a lot of good questions. So I won't be able to get to all of them here, but definitely going to get into several of them. So some of the questions I, I got had to do with specific things having to do with ancient Egypt, such as language, time, daily life, social status, etc. But other questions had more to do with how to learn about ancient Egypt or how to get into the field of Egyptology. So even though I can't cover them all, I'm going to cover some from each of these categories. So let's get right to it. Now, of course, um, you'll have to forgive me if I totally butcher your name, especially if it's an Instagram handle, because sometimes it's just not clear how to pronounce these. Um, but even if it's not an Instagram handle, uh, sorry, feel free to correct me online. But our first question comes from Totoro81JP on Instagram, who asked, um, is there any active excavation or research being carried out in any of the three pyramids of Giza? Well, Yes, in fact, there actually are many different projects that have been working there uh, over the years. And this includes um, a couple that are really the ones that stand out most. I, there's probably many more that I'm not even thinking of, but I'll highlight the two sort of recent uh, most well-known ones. So first is the Scan Pyramids Project. Um, and this was actually started only a few years ago in 2015. Um, and it has a variety of collaborators, including the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, multiple universities, and multiple tech companies involved. Their aim is to measure and document the pyramids through use of radiographic muons, infrared thermography, photogrammetry, and 3D re reconstruction. So some of the things that they are um, looking for there are basically trying to see um, if they can accurately measure um, the pyramids, and they're doing this partially through what's called a thermal map, basically seeing which part of the pyramid absorb more muons than others, and then showing that can show you which areas of the pyramid are more or less dense. Um, <clears throat> and about a year ago, they actually released some results that suggested that there might be an actual opening or void in the Great Pyramid of Khufu above what's usually called the Grand Gallery. Uh, so you can go actually to their website and view a bunch of things here, including videos such as the one you're seeing right now, um, where they go into uh, a bunch of different things. They also have publications and news about uh, what the project is up to and so forth. So you can go there to, to check out more. Now, the other project uh, that I'd like to talk about is one by uh, Egyptologist or archaeologist, I should say rather, Mark Lehner. And he's actually been working at Giza for over 30 years and in lots of different areas of the site. So I can't go into all of it. There's a lot of it. Um, and also um, ERA or Ancient Egypt Research Associates, which Lehner heads, also um, it conducts a lot of these uh, excavations. So that's the website you see here and you can go there for much more information. But the one part of their project that I'd particularly like to talk about, because I think it's really exciting, is a town that in modern times is called Hate El Garab, or the Wall of the Crow, which is located right on the Giza Plateau. Um, and there aren't any wonderful photos here, unfortunately, but you can open up an interactive map that shows you where the site is. Um, there's also a bunch of other things on this website that are wonderful. But the interesting thing about this town is that there are different areas of it so for people of different status so some of the areas clearly must have been administrative areas based on the remains that were found there as well as the size of buildings other areas seem to be sort of um, overnight lodgings or barracks you could say for people working at the site or perhaps also for teams that were bringing building materials and other things to the giza plateau to support the people who are working to build the pyramids um, and now, this could really turn into a video all its own, so I'm going to try and keep this really brief. But one of the things I think is particularly exciting is that evidence they found at the site here um, actually gives us a lot of information about the diet of people and what they were eating, how they were being paid also because they were paid in food rations. And a lot of the things they found also suggest that some of these areas may have been just for sort of overnight sleeping of teams like the one um, that was actually led by a man named Merer, um, who, uh, let me see, trying to get up my protect, uh, 
right screen here so I can show it to you, um, who left behind a whole bunch of papyri at the uh, Red Sea site of Wadi al Daraf, which actually document him uh, conducting a, a bunch of different projects with a team. One of those projects was delivering stone for the casing stones of Khufu's pyramid from Torah to Giza. So it, it's really interesting how this could actually be linked to um, Hayd al-Gharab as well. And um, anyway, I'll keep it brief here, but I haven't made a video about the discoveries at Wadi al Daraf before, but I've certainly thought about it. So if it's something you'd like me to do, let me know in the comments below. And in the meantime, we'll move on um, to other questions. But I definitely would love to discuss this and the other questions I'm going to talk about here in um, the new Voices of Ancient Egypt Facebook community. So if you haven't actually joined yet, it's actually brand new. So you're not alone. If you haven't seen it yet, you can go to bit.ly slash voices community and sign up there. All right. So moving on to the next question. Um, also from Instagram, Isabel uh, Noveas asked, I'd like to know about the Osiris festival or Hecker and what was its purpose in ancient Egypt? So the Osiris festival, which is sometimes called Koyak because of the name of the month, this was the last month during the flood season, it celebrated the mythical figure of Osiris, including his death, his triumph over death, where he's basically revived or reborn into the afterlife and him becoming then the ruler of that afterlife. You could sort of look at him as a kind of king of the dead. And by extension, his, his festival also celebrated um, all of these aspects of him and also the idea of rebirth and fertility in a wider sense. And this is actually why it was scheduled at the time of year when it was at the end of the flood and beginning of the growing season. This is when the waters receded and the land reemerged and those first seeds were sprouting and you had this new green life coming out of the ground. And this is really no coincidence at all with um, the timing of this festival because Osiris is actually heavily associated with fertility and rebirth. This is why sometimes he's shown actually with green skin uh, in the art. So the celebration of his festival um, took place in many different locations, actually, not just one. But one of the main places was Abydos because this was the main cult center for Osiris, where there was a large temple for him and so forth. Now, the celebrations actually incorporated uh, multiple aspects to them. And I'm going to talk about the two main ones. One is really the, the primary one. The first one I'll talk about, which is a basically large procession or festival. Um, depending on how you look at it, could be kind of like a parade of sorts. And during this parade, not only did they take the statue of the god out of the local temple, um, which you can see towards the kind of bottom uh, right area of this map, and they would take this statue of the god and transport it in a boat being carried by priests and would actually process up the valley towards the cliffs, which are on the top part of the screen. But they didn't just walk. Part of this, they also reenacted the mythology of Osiris while they did this procession. So they actually carried out um, the whole idea of Osiris being king, him being attacked by his brother Seth, and then being resurrected and brought to new life in the realm of the dead. It also usually included a later part of the story where his son Horus then fought with Seth to avenge his father's death. Now, at Abydos, this reenactment took place, um, I, as I mentioned, as a procession from the temple up through the valley and actually out to an area called Um al Gab, out near the cliffs. And interestingly, this is actually a early dynastic cemetery where a bunch of kings from the first dynasty and some from the second dynasty are buried. But by the Middle Kingdom, people actually thought that one of the tombs here was the actual tomb of Osiris. Um, so they essentially ended this kind of procession with bringing Osiris to his grave and acting out a funeral for him. So the second main activity that took place in this festival, which we have um, evidence for later on in Egyptian history, is sometimes called the making of corn, a corn mummy or corn Osiris. Now this is the use of the term corn and as in British English, not American English, it can be a little confusing for Americans here, basically meaning grain. Okay, so these were essentially 
a bunch of earth, sand, and seed that was wetted and then shaped like the form of Osiris. And then because it was wet, they would keep it for several days while those seeds would sprout, creating new life right out of that form of Osiris. Again, symbolizing his role in fertility and rebirth. And these figures were actually often made during the festival, allowed to sprout, then kept for an entire year before they were then buried, uh, sometimes actually within a little coffin of their own like you see here. Now, for more information related to the Osiris Festival, you can check out my video on ancient Egyptian festivals and celebrations, which I'll link in the description below and in the cards for this video. And also coincidentally, in a few weeks, I have a video coming out on the story of Osiris, so you can keep your eyes peeled for that, and I will add the link here once that comes out as well. All right, so our third question is actually a combination of questions from three different people. So I'm only going to paraphrase here, not quote them. But this comes from uh, Instagram user uh, Rosita Deancora, and then also on Facebook, Bharat uh, Ramakrishna, and via email, Stephen Hill as well. And they all asked related questions about the decipherment of hieroglyphs, how researchers figured out the sounds of the signs, and also about the liter literacy rather rate in ancient Egypt. Um, they also asked some other things too, but this is basically all I figured I could fit in this video. So, okay. So these can be somewhat of a tricky set of topics. And here's why. First, on rates of literacy, one of the problems is we only have general estimates of population, as well as general estimates of how many people were literate. So saying the actual percentage of people who are literate is tricky. Uh, however, estimates do range usually between 1 and 5% for most of Egyptian history. And in addition, uh, I think it's important to note also that the majority of people who were literate may not have actually known how to read and write hieroglyphs because the most common script that was used in every day was hieratic for most of history or in later periods, demotic. And so a lot of people that we might call scribes who were reading and writing were actually functioning in, in hieratic or demotic, not in hieroglyphs. So that would make the percentage even lower if we we're talking about just hieroglyphs. So second, on the topic of sounds represented by hieroglyphs, um, as well as those cursive forms that I was just talking about, it can be a hairy one. And originally this question was asked about how scientists originally figured this out. So let's start there. Basically, the earliest understanding of sounds of hieroglyphs uh, came from the basically equating Greek names that had been transcribed into Egyptian hieroglyphs and figuring out which hieroglyphs corresponded to which Greek sounds. And this, of course, it was famously done by some early scholars. Um, the final one, really, who made a much bigger splash was Jean-Francois Champollion. Um, and I've actually got a whole video on that and how that was done on the decipherment. And I will link that, of course, in the description and in the cards here. So another way that sounds were figured out were from Coptic. Coptic is the fifth and final stage of the ancient Egyptian language, and it was still used all still today even in the Egyptian Christian or what's called the Coptic Church. Now, because Coptic was written with mostly Greek letters, with a few demotic letters for sounds that Greek didn't have, and Coptic was never lost the way that hieroglyphs were, there were always people who could read it. Um, this made it much easier for people like Champollion to be able to actually know a whole lot of Egyptian vocabulary before they knew really anything about reading hieroglyphs. And this helped once he started to be able to decipher hieroglyphs, how to basically plug in some of that vocabulary from before. And Coptic is also really helpful because it does write vowels, whereas earlier scripts in Egyptian do not actually represent the vowels at all. So this gives us a better idea of how words were pronounced. However, everything I just told you about how scholars figured this out um, can be somewhat problematic. And here's why. First of all, Greek and Egyptian did not necessarily have the exact same sounds in them. So any rendering of Egyptian with Greek characters is going to probably change our understanding of how the words sounded at least a little bit. In addition, Coptic was primarily used in the first few centuries of our era after Christianity became the dominant religion in Egypt. So this is well over 3,000 years after the first hieroglyphs were written. The Egyptian language and the writing system changed significantly over this time, including in the grammar, syntax, and phonology, that is the sound values. 
So therefore, even though we can understand a fair amount about the sounds because of Coptic, uh, this doesn't necessarily reflect how people were actually saying these words in earlier periods. Now, because of these issues and um, modern conventions that we use today for pronouncing ancient Egyptian names, the truth is that most of the ways that we pronounce things really have more to do with just the modern conventions rather than what we really know about how to pronounce the words. And this is really just so that scholars can actually talk to each other about this stuff in a common kind of language, so to speak, and not always have to write out individual letters to make themselves understood. However, that's not to say that all is lost. Linguists have definitely been making important strides over the past several decades to improve our understanding of the phonological system. So for example, um, there, there are basically three different things that they use to do this. One of this is Coptic, like I just talked about, and there are a couple others too. And this has actually led us to understand that some of the signs in ancient Egypt actually changed sounds over time. So they started out as one sound and changed to another. One of the ways scholars have figured this out is by using comparative linguistics to compare Egyptian to other languages in the same family of languages, that is the Afroasiatic phylum. So for example, the word kab, that is Q aleph b in ancient Egyptian, is equivalent to the Semitic um, root Q R B. In both cases, that these are the roots for something, meaning the in interior part of something. So because of this, we can conclude that what we see is an aleph in ancient Egyptian, although we pronounce it today like an A in English, it actually would have originally had an R sound. Now, of course, scholars are not basing this on just one example like this. It takes many, many examples to draw such conclusions, but this is just to give you an idea of how this works. So another source of information comes from transcriptions into and out of other contemporary languages um, during the time of the ancient Egyptians. So for example, the Amarna letters, which were written in Akkadian, and you can see an example here, actually feature many Egyptian names in them because this was correspondence between Egypt and the Near East. And likewise, there are also a number of texts um, from the um, from Egypt, rather, that are in hieroglyphs or in hieratic that represent names of people from the Near East who had Northeast Semitic names. And so basically by seeing how um, they tried to render Egyptian names and words into Akkadian, which is a syllabic script that did use vowels and had full syllables, gives us a better idea of how they were really pronouncing words at the time. And also even you know, transcribing those Near Eastern names into Egyptian hieroglyphs, uh, because we're more familiar with the sounds in some of those Near Eastern languages, helps us also understand how they were using hieroglyphs to represent sounds. So this is definitely still a work in progress and we'll continue to improve our understanding of this. Um, and so, you know, stay tuned, of course, for, for more news on this. And if you want to get to learn hieroglyphs for yourself and you haven't already gotten my free guide for getting started, you should head over to voicesofancientegypt.com slash glyphs and pick it up there. All right. So our next question, also from Instagram, comes from Sylph Kolopras. Um, who asked, what popular level books would you recommend to get people to learn more about ancient Egypt? So the first book that I recommend to anyone wanting to learn about ancient Egypt, and this is a general book, I don't know if you had a very specific area in mind, but for getting a basic overview of the history and culture of ancient Egypt, I very strongly recommend an introduction, ancient Egypt rather, an introduction by Salima Ikram. And it covers everything from the basics of ancient Egyptian history to daily life to mummification and burial practices. And I'll include an Amazon link for this book in the description below so you can easily find it. And if you're interested in more book recommendations or any particular topics that you want recommendations for, you can let me know in the comments below or by hopping over to the new Voices of Ancient Egypt community on Facebook. Of course, as I said before, you can go to bit.ly slash voices community to hop over there. All right, so our fifth and final question today comes from um, the Instagram user Galmida1204, and he asked how to proceed with an Egyptology career, basically how to get started, how to get into Egyptology. So this is a um, kind of a big topic, and I know a lot of people have this question. So strap in, because this is going to be a long one, but 
I really wanted to address it because I know a lot of people have questions. I get asked this a lot. And I have to start with a bit of a preamble. And I don't mean to be all doom and gloom here, but I do feel it's really important to keep it real about the reality when it comes to careers in Egyptology. So <laughs> with that in mind, um, I want to tell you that even though Egyptology is a relatively small field, there are many, many, many more with people with PhDs in the field than there are jobs for Egyptologists, you know, traditional jobs like at universities and museums. And I know a lot of people who did everything right through graduate school and after they published a ton, they had teaching experience, they were, I mean, they were known in the field doing really well, and ended up actually leaving Egyptology because after several years, they still could not find a permanent position in Egyptology. They had, you know, like po prestigious postdocs and things like that, which were temporary positions, but just did not land that long-term permanent position that they really needed to support themselves and their families. And so they ended up going on a different career path. Some people have also left because they really just realized that academia wasn't for them and they needed to do something different. Now, I want to underscore that I think that there's actually nothing wrong with doing this. I mean, if you discover it's not for you, no matter how much time you've invested, make that change. It's better to make the rest of your life fit with what you want than try to stick with something because of this, you know, misconceived idea about what they call sunk costs. Um, but I also do think it's important to study what you're interested in. Don't just pick something because you think you'll make a lot of money in it or something like that. But I did want you to have your eyes wide open about this, about the job market in ancient in um, Egyptology. And it's just simply the nature of the job market these days. And it's not just Egyptology. A lot of other academic fields are like this way, this too. The supply is just much greater than the demand, unfortunately, with positions. And another thing to keep in mind is um, that most of these, uh, what do I want to say, PhD programs that I'm talking about, in North America, at least, do take seven to 10 years to complete. And that's a huge chunk of your life. So just keep that in mind here. Okay, so if you still want to get a PhD in Egyptology after all of that, and you're actually still watching this video after all that doom and gloom, let's jump into, you know, the nitty gritty of these details. So just one more preface, though, which is that my experience is with the North American academic system. So I can only speak to how the programs work here in North America. And it can actually be quite different if you're looking at places like Europe, Egypt, Australia, or Japan. So you'll want to ask people in those areas if those are the specific places um, that you are interested in working in. So, all right, after the longest preamble ever, we'll jump right in now. So this is probably obvious, but the easiest way to get into Egyptology really is to attend a university that has an Egyptology program and major in that for your undergraduate or bachelor's degree. Now, if you want to start planning as early as middle or high school, that's actually a good idea too, because I would advise that you do things like study a language that's related to Egyptology if you can. So for example, French and German can be really useful. Take that as your foreign language if you can, one of those. Um, and of course, this presumes that English is your first language. So if English is not your first language, you also need English. So make sure to improve your English uh, as well. And this is because most scholarship in Egyptology is published in, in either French, German, or English, and you need to be able to read that. So, of course, if you can actually manage to study an ancient language, even if it's not an Egyptian language, like, say, Hebrew or Akkadian or something like that, or even Latin, even though it's not directly related while you're in high school, that would be a good idea, too. And any any possibility of any kind of, like, archaeology classes or maybe helping out on a local excavation would also be great experience at that level. Okay, so let's say you've done these things if you can in high school or maybe not but you just can't attend a university that has an Egyptology program for your undergraduate degree. For whatever reason, maybe you just can't live in that area, it's too expensive, or you didn't get into a place, whatever. Let me just say, this is not the end of the world. In fact, this is my exact situation. Um, of So I actually went to a university that did not have any Egyptology at all for my undergraduate degree. 
So of the choices you have that are actually realistic places for you to attend university, make sure to pick a place that has the closest match for you for what you're interested in. So this could involve um, them having programs that relate to other areas of the world like the Near East that are nearby, or maybe they have a really strong archaeology program or something like that that's related to the area of ancient Egypt that you're especially interested in. So for example, the university I attended as an undergraduate had a very strong focus in the Near East, the ancient Near East that is, and modern Middle East, but they really didn't have anything relating to Egypt. However, I leveraged what was available there. I studied Hebrew for three years, and I also took two courses at a local museum, the courses that were focused around ancient Egypt, which I couldn't get actually at my university, but I was fortunate that my university had a deal with that museum, allowing me to take those courses. Now, I I actually had to work somewhat at at being able to do this because even though um, these courses were available, you technically were only supposed to take one while you were a student there uh, so that it left enough space for other people because they only took two students per university for these classes. Um, But because I was planning to go to graduate school in Egyptology the following year, I contacted the curator of the museum who was running the second class I wanted to take. And she made an exception and let me be the third person from my university to take that class, uh, even though the official rules didn't really allow for that. So it's really important to do what you can and make connections and um, ask people's advice, get access to what you can and so forth and make the best of it. So as I said, you know, make the most of the resources that you have and do what you can. So Although I'll never know exactly what was weighed most heavily when it came to universities evaluating my graduate applications, I do really think that um, their decision to admit me in a lot of cases probably had a lot to do with the relationships I'd built with Egyptologists who were known in the field, particularly the people at the museum who I'd worked with. They'd seen my work. That really helped. Um, And then also having done well in learning a Semitic language like Hebrew, which is not the same as Egyptian, but it is related um, and has a script that's different from English, showed that I was able to handle a language like that. And then also, of course, having a generally good academic record also helps. So I'm sure all these things came into play. So depending on whatever is available for you, you know, you'll want to focus on the part that's most intriguing to you. So if you're most interested in archaeology, you know, go with that. Art history, that ancient languages, go with that. So at some universities, this might mean majoring in classics or in anthropology, for example. So just work with it. Do the best you can with the resources you have. One other thing to um, keep in mind, and this definitely varies from other parts of the world, is that one of the things you need to do to go to graduate school in North America is take what's called the GRE or graduate record examination. And this is an examination that's used in many different fields for graduate school. It doesn't have content specifically related to Egyptology, but it's considered a good indicator of whether your current level of education makes you well suited for graduate study, basically. So this exam is certainly not everything when it comes to getting into grad school, but some programs do weigh it more than others, and it's generally important to at least get a very good score, and the higher it is, that can only really help you. So I really think it was actually pretty significant in my case. So because of its importance, you should definitely prepare well in advance for the GRE, take practice tests, study with books and online programs for how to prepare for the GRE, and take more practice tests. Practice, practice, practice. Those practice practice tests especially will let you know where your weak areas are and um, what you should basically work on um, Uh over time. And so then you can basically hone in on, you know, maybe you need to brush up on your algebra or whatever it is, and you can do that. And if you're still having trouble after a lot of self-study and you're just not getting the score you want, um, you could also consider, of course, some specific tutoring or classes for the GRE. Okay, so now that you are almost finished with your undergraduate degree and you've been working on all of these things, you're trying to decide which places to apply to for grad school. So There are, of course, a lot of resources on the internet now, and this is going to make me seem really old, but there's definitely a lot more now than there was when I was looking. So you want to really make use of those resources. That includes 
um, the department websites at different universities, which can give you a lot of information about programs. Um, and there are also some wonderful websites, such as this one called Egyptology Resources, that's run by Egyptologist Nigel Strudwick. Um, and um, you can basically go there and find all kinds of resources. So even though this is run through the Fitzwilliam Museum at Cambridge, uh, Nigel Strudwick has put together just a huge number of resources here. And so, for example, you can go over um, to, the, to the right here and click on Egyptological Institutions. And this brings up a box over here and you can pick your geographic area wherever you are. So we're talking about North America right now, so I'll click on that one. And this gives you a really nice list of different universities and links to the departments that have programs. So this is um, maybe not always 100% comprehensive because there are some places that have sort of minor level programs, you could say, where there's some Egyptologists, but they don't have a larger program with multiple Egyptologists, but this will give you the, the biggest ones and definitely the most prominent ones and go here. And then after that, you'll wanna go ahead and you know chase these down and go ahead and look at some of these department websites, see what the requirements are, see what they offer, what are the, what's their focus? Do they focus more on archeology, span more on art history, more in philology or, or language rather? Um, and you'll want to dig into this and think about what your interests are. I know it's, it's still kind of early if you have a very general undergraduate degree and you don't have a lot of Egyptology background. It's a little early to, you know, decide exactly what you're interested in. But you do need to ask yourself these questions and see, like, do you do you enjoy more studying the physical remains of Egypt? You know, the... Um, what's actually found on the ground, human remains, etc. If so, you should probably go into archaeology or bioarchaeology. If you're more interested in literature, religion, historic documents and letters, things like that, you really want to go probably into philology or that is, you know, the language. Uh, but then again, if you're more interested in some of the pictures you're seeing here rotating around in terms of the, the art or the architecture and so forth, you probably want to go to a place that has more of an art history kind of focus or that's maybe even hosted within an art history department. So these are all things to keep in mind and you should definitely look into, um, you know, while you're here, uh, looking at some of these different departments. It's also uh, a good idea to, you know, take a look at some of the faculty as well. And whoops, that one, that link is bad, unfortunately. So um, let's see if we can get one uh, here to take another look at just another one, just to give you an idea of what this looks like. So this um, gives you a great idea of what this department is like here. And, you know, you can go and go into people and go to faculty and staff, for example. And here's Betsy Bryan, who um, is their chair of Egyptian art and archaeology. You can go here, read a bit about her uh, and about her research. Another resource also to take a look at is a lot of scholars now have their articles up on a site called academia.edu. Um, and so you can go there and uh, search for people and see if they have their articles up in there. Now, this site does try to trick you into making an account to be able to view things. You actually can view articles without making an account. You just can't download PDFs. So it's it's just a little tricky. You have to like scroll further down. They make it look like you're not going to see the article and so forth. So anyway, that's just a little tip there. Um, academia, not everybody's on there, but a lot of people are and they put their articles up. So it's a good idea to investigate not just the department and the university, but the specific faculty who, who work there. And these are the people you're going to be working with really intensely over time. So um, you'll want to take a close look at what they're working on and see if that's a good fit for you. Now, I should note that even though I'm saying you should think about your specialty and what you want to focus on uh, in terms of, you know, ancient Egypt, you'll also want to um, think about the fact that you actually, in most North American programs, need to be proficient in both archaeology and in the language aspect. So um, this is a bit different from other parts of the world. So programs in Europe, for example, people tend to specialize a lot earlier. So by the time you get to your PhD, you're already working in a very specific research project, and you're not going to be taking courses and learning about different things and passing exams and so forth. So um, 
that is something that really uh, stands apart in terms of the programs in these different areas. All right, so once you've applied and you start getting letters back from these programs that you applied to, one thing to keep in mind is whether these offers of admission that you're getting also come with offers of funding. So graduate school, like undergraduate school, um, university here in North America, especially in the United States, tends to be extremely expensive. Now, it does vary by university, but it is usually very expensive. And on top of this, you're going to need to be able to actually pay for your living expenses, your rent, your food, etc. So because of this cost, I really always strongly advise people who want to get a PhD in Egyptology to not do it unless they are offered a good funding package. Now, this funding package may come with more or less strings attached in terms of working for a department or whatever, but just make sure there is some kind of funding involved. Really, I strongly advise you. You can do it without funding. I know people who have and they made it through and these people, let me tell you, are strong as nails. And sometimes they've been very successful in the field. Other times, sometimes they've regretted it, you know, and ended up with this just mountains of debt. So this decision ultimately is up to you. It's a personal one, but I just, I do strongly advise that you, you know, really consider the long-term aspects of if you don't get that funding and you have to take out a bunch of loans or work on the side, how long it's going to take you and all the debt you'll end up with. Um, so just, you know, these are things to keep in mind with that. Um, of course, one other thing to consider is that you can study Egyptology in a less traditional way on the side. So you could do this through self-study, through online videos <laughs> like this. Uh, or, you know, through online Egyptology programs like the one they have at the University of Manchester, for example. Um, there are lots of different ways you can do this. This may not take you to a traditional route, um, but sometimes that even happens too. So some Egyptologists who earned a PhD in Egyptology had a completely different full-time career and still produced research in the field and then after retiring produced even more. So I'm, you know, particularly looking at Aidan Dodson for this. If you haven't seen his work before, go look him up. Um, he's a really prolific writer, has a lot of popular books, and he did a lot of what he did while he was working a full-time civil ser servant's job for decades. And then he retired from that and started doing Egyptology full-time after retirement. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, not just this traditional path. So, you know, if you have more questions about this or you just want to talk about it, need clarification or anything like that, of course, you can leave comments here on the video. You can also, of course, hop over to the community on Facebook by going to bit.ly slash voices community, and we can talk about it there. It's definitely a big topic. And any of the other questions, of course, here or anything else you want to know, make sure to hop on over and let me know over there and we can chat about it. And so that's it for now. I'll see you in the next video, which you can click on right here.